Praise be Jesus Christ. Welcome to episode 9 of CarmelCast. My name is Father Michael Joseph of St. Therese. And Carmel Cast is a production of the Institute of Carmelite Studies Publications. For more information, you can go to icspublications.org. And today we have with us the managing editor of ICS Publications, Brother Pierre Giorgio of Christ the King. So welcome, brother. Thanks for having me. It's good to be back here. Yes, definitely. On Carmel Cast. <laughs> yes, you might remember Brother Pierre Giorgio from last season. Um, and I was fired from the, no, I'm just kidding. I don't want to even go into that, you know, <laughs> but, we'll, <laughs> but he's with us now. That's the important thing. Um, <laughs> but today, our, as we know, October is the, the month of the Holy Rosary, the month, the month of our, our lady, special devotion to our lady. So we thought this would be a good opportunity to speak about the Blessed Virgin Mary and in, in the life of Carmel mm -hmm. and, and especially under the title of Our Lady of Mount Carmel and her scapular. So, Brother Pierre Giorgio, could you maybe share a little bit about how Our Lady has impacted your life and your own Carmelite vocation? Yeah, I mean, it, Our Lady as our mother, um, as uh, sort of the, um, really the foundation of our life. If you read our, even our vow formulas and in our constitutions, it talks about how um, we make vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience. Um, in a life with Mary in allegiance to Jesus Christ. So that whole element of life with Mary um, is a huge part of, of, uh, of the religious life for the, for the Carmelite order. Um, we see here her as sort of the lady of the house. Um, mm. and, and in that way, she, um, yeah, she, she lives alongside us as uh, both a sister, and we call ourselves the brothers, discalced brothers of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, mm. That's the actual official name of the order. Um, so we have sort of this brother-sister role uh, with Our Lady, but also um, as the mother of the church, as the, as, uh, the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Um, she plays an important role in our daily life uh, as sort of the patroness of the contemplative life. Um, from the very beginning of the church, we have to remember that even before Pentecost, um, Our Lady had already received uh, the Holy Spirit and had... Um, already had that commissioning um, from her from the very beginning of um, of her life with Jesus as her as as his mother yes yes and it's it's a powerful reminder for us Carmelites too that it's yeah, it's not um, just a devotion in a sense for us mm -hmm. um, that she's at the at the center of our life and our vocation and that's that's not something we kind of just added at a certain point either it it goes back to the to the very origins are of who we are and um, so maybe you could take this time to speak a little bit about that history of, of the Carmelites and, and their special relationship with Mary from the, the very beginning. Yeah, the history of our order and the, very, and the sort of the roots of our order. I mean, it's always a question, well, where do you want to start, right? Mm -hmm. um, because there's this very uh, fundamental biblical uh, uh, grounding um, in sort of the history of our order uh, that already before the first hermits were appearing on Mount Carmel, this place had a history, right? Um, a biblical history, but uh, from the foundation of uh, of you know men as hermits coming to this place, uh, the, the, the Wadi Kareth on Mount Carmel, um, it was it happened in a particular historical context and time and place, and that was the uh, the Third Crusades. Um, the interesting thing about the Third Crusades is that um, it ended in a peace truce uh, with the. Um, with the Arab armies uh, under the direction of Saladin. Um, and uh, basically what happened was the um, Christian pilgrims were allowed to enter Jerusalem, but um, the church and the, the, king, uh, the kingdom of Jerusalem that had existed up until the Second Crusade was sort of ousted and relocated to the nearby city of Acre, which was mm -hmm. really only about 14 miles from where the hermits were living on Mount Carmel. Uh, so very closer to uh, Mount Carmel than Jerusalem actually is. So really the center of Christian life was, was located um, around the Bay of Haifa. Mm. Um, and at the pinnacle of this bay is the, the propitiatory point of Mount Carmel, um, the Cave of Elijah just below uh, that point. Uh, the, and that has, uh, that's considered to be the biblical place where um, 
the prophet Elijah uh, lived and stayed um, <clears throat> during the drought, the three-year drought that's uh, talked about in the book of First Kings. So in uh, this place, that uh, kind of this, this new milieu of, um, of Christianity in the Holy Land, what's called the Latin East, um, a lot of church life is going on, and um, many of these crusaders and pilgrims uh, who came to the Holy Land during the Third Crusade maybe didn't expect to ever return home. Maybe they expected to die in battle or um, to live the rest of their life in the Holy Land or in Jerusalem, um, the place where Jesus walked, right? Um, so when this sort of turn of events happened where, yes, they were allowed to go into Jerusalem as pilgrims, uh, but not necessarily live there permanently, uh, there was this sort of change that or unexpected sort of turn of events that led to um, sort of a revitalization of Christianity in Israel, but in a different sort of location um, in that uh, northwestern part of the, of the state of Israel as we know it today. Um, so, yeah, this, the, these men coming there, a very mixed bag of people from everywhere from crusaders to pilgrims, um, living a life, a contemplative life um, in caves, really, mm -hmm. um, sought a rule from the Latin patriarch of Jerusalem, uh, St. Albert of Jerusalem, whose feast day we celebrate in September. Um, he wrote them a rule, a, a way of life. Um, and one of the key uh, important elements of that life is that they're supposed to have a common oratory where they go to Mass together every day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, generally when we think of the hermit life, we think of living alone uh, by ourselves and praying alone. Uh, but there was something unique about Carmel um, that St. Albert sort of saw in his wisdom um, as sort of the, the father figure of this community that really it's important to, to be together for meals and the sacraments, to have some community amongst themselves. Um, so he writes in his rule that uh, every that the, that the community needs to have a common space uh, for an oratory to, where mass will be will be heard every day, um, and these these hermits uh, chose as sort of the patron of the patroness of their of their chapel it was a, a chapel dedicated to Our Lady, um, and this is at a time when you know not every not every church in every other town is St. Mary's Catholic <laughs> Church, right? Um, this is something that sort of evolved over time. So it, it wasn't um, necessarily, it wasn't a rare occurrence, but it wasn't as common as it would be thought of today in terms of naming a church after Our Lady. And, you know, it's uh, interesting because um, there's a, fen a French pilgrim that comes in the 1220s. So this is maybe 30 years after the hermits are getting started. And he uh, writes as sort of the first sort of bystander pilgrim historical you know, primary source talking about the, the, the chapel of Our Lady on Mount Carmel. Um, so already by the 1220s, the chapel is built and there's pilgrims being received. So it's kind of interesting how uh, this gets started really quickly. Sure. Yeah, and, and as you said, there's something so significant in naming the chapel after Our Lady. We know that in the Holy Land, you know, every part had some connection with something from the gospel or mm -hmm. from the life of Christ or from the Old Testament even. Um, and we know Mount Carmel was famous for Elijah's presence on Mount Carmel and that the fathers of the church saw in Elijah's vision of the cloud an image of Our Lady, that, that Elijah saw on Mount Carmel this image of Our Lady, this kind of prefigurement of the Virgin Mary giving birth to the, to the, uh, water, the, the water that would give us life in Jesus Christ. Um, so that Mount Carmel had this Marian connotation mm -hmm built into it. And so by the hermits settling there and naming a chapel after Our Lady, what, is, what does that say then about how they saw the Virgin Mary in their life? Yeah, I think that passage in, in First Kings would have been very much alive in the imagination of the first hermits. Um, one thing that I was thinking about recently with this is whenever you, so the famous scene uh, in First Kings uh, when Elijah, the prophet, tells a servant to go up seven times and, and tell him what, you know, what do you see, what do you see, right? Um, and on the seventh time, he sees the little cloud like a, as small as a man's hand, right? This is the, the line. Um, it's interesting when you, when you look at sort of the parallel passages elsewhere in the Bible, when a sacrifice takes place on a mountain, right? So you have uh, Abraham sacrificing Isaac on Mount Moriah. And then, of course, I think the paradigmatic sort of sacrifice on a mountain is Christ on Calvary. Mm -hmm. So this uh, Elijah telling the servant, go up, what do you see? Um, I see the, this cloud like, a, like the hand of a man, or as small as the, as the hand of a man, uh, coming rising out of the sea. And then uh, 
our Lord on the cross, on the, on the mountain of Calvary, seeing, saying to uh, his, his beloved disciple, his serpent, uh, behold your mother. So what do you see? Behold your mother. I think this was something that would have been kind of in their imaginations. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting parallel. And there's a you know, great spiritual depth to that. Yeah, definitely. And to think that that's the gospel too for Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Yeah, exactly. So it's a yeah. beautiful connection there. Um, and, you know, we know back then too, when you chose someone as your patroness or patron, this had a lot of consequences for your life in that feudal society at the time. Right. Um, so how do you th- how do you see um, those original hermits by choosing Our Lady as their patroness? Um, what what that would mean for their life then and how they saw themselves in relation to her? Yeah, so I mean, this is the third crusade. This is uh, the crusade made famous by Robin Hood in the legends, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Richard the Lionheart um, and uh, King Louis of France, right? These are the these are the uh, the kings who were initiating the crusade. Frederick Barbarossa, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor Emperor at the time. Um, so there's kings, there's queens. Um, this is this is kind of the um, the high Middle Ages in a way. Um, where we kind of have those images, right, of, uh, you know, Robin Hood taking Maid Marian as his patroness and, mm-hmm. and fighting for her cause and things like that. Um, and, of course, those legends came later, but it's that's the time that this is all happening, right? Uh, so this idea of allegiance to Jesus Christ, this is in, this is in the, ru- the rule, the, 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 in, our, in today's our profession formula, allegiance to Jesus Christ and life with Mary and allegiance mm-hmm. to Jesus Christ. So um, a knight would, would, would uh, pledge allegiance to his lord or his king. Um, so it's interesting that in the, that in the rule it, it has this language. Um, it, it's almost in the same way of a feudal contract, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in a spiritual way, that uh, rather than pledging allegiance to the king or the lord, we're pledging our allegiance to Jesus, who is king. It mm-hmm. works for me because it's my title, Christ the King, yes, right? Yes. So it's uh, it, it, there's that whole aspect of of, um, of the role between a king and his servant, and and it, there's many sort of examples of this in scripture of um, the different passages of of stewards and um, as sort of an, an image of someone who serves the king well or poorly, depending on the situation, uh, the parallel that our Lord talks about. So alongside this is also um, uh, a knight would take a patron, or uh, well, rather a patroness, a lady uh, who, she, who he would fight for, right, as sort of a, a way to, um, uh, to honor, uh, to honor a, a particular lady um, and to, yeah, it was, it was just sort of a way to uh, be unified with with someone uh, in that, that sort of idea of chivalry, right? To mm-hmm. fight for the cause of a, of a lady, defend her honor, mm-hmm. um, that sort of thing. So a knight would often wear some sort of sign of the lady's, um, you know, her, heraldic sort of signification or, or something like that. Um, so for the later, you know, the Carmelites to start wearing the garments of, of Our Lady, uh, the brown scapular, which we can get to, to next, sure. I think shows a lot about um, sort of what was going on in their imaginations as they formed this life for themselves, mm-hmm. um, and and not just imagination in the sense of like fantasy, but this was really they took it seriously, and this is and we take it seriously today as well. Yes, exactly, and and that concept of allegiance to Jesus Christ with Mary, that she would be the perfect model how to live that allegiance to Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. and so it would make sense that in their in their scheme of things in the spiritual life that they would take Mary as as the way mm-hmm. in order to to more fully give themselves to Jesus Christ right and and how providential that they would be in the place of our lady on Mount Carmel mm-hmm. um, but I guess yeah then tying in then how how did the habit kind of come to be and, and this whole you know sense of the scapular that that many people know about the brown scapular right well so historically after some time uh, probably, uh, maybe about 60 years, I think. So if we if we start the count around 1150, or sorry, 1190, um, and then move um, to about 12, late 1240s, mid 1240s to 1250, uh, we know that there is sort of a turn of events in the Holy Land where it becomes no longer safe for Christians. And uh, a lot of them are returning to Europe until they return uh, during the Fourth Crusade, maybe about 20 years later. Um, so in this sort of time of uncertainty, you know, they're, they're no longer receiving protection from um, the the kingdom that is centered in Acre, 20, 20 miles or less than twenty miles away, 
Um, so there's this uncertainty. They don't know where they're going to go. Um, they've grown significantly in numbers mm. uh, from when where they just, where they had first started. So uh, we know that they uh, they don't move all at once, but over time they actually they I think they get so big that they start establishing other locations around the area. And we know that they go to Syria for a time, or a group goes to Syria. Uh, we know that there's a group that goes to the island of Cyprus, which was right across the Mediterranean from mm-hmm. from Israel. Um, so there's this sort of migration from uh, from Mount Carmel um, towards probably where most of these men came from, which was. Um, you know, the kingdoms already mentioned, the Holy Roman Empire in Italy, uh, the, uh, Frederick Barbarossa was Sicilian, so there was a, a group of Sicilians probably in this community. Um, a group goes to Aylesford in England, so there was probably, uh, you know, that connection with, with King Richard. Um, so there's probably, there's a community, there's a community that goes to, um, back to England, and then there's a community that goes to the south of France. Um, so that's how we kind of get an idea of where these people were coming from, where these men kind of, they're, they're their history was, and and when things become untenable, they return home. Mm-hmm. However, they want to continue, right? This life they've already begun. Um, the prior general of the order at the time was was Saint Simon Stock, um, and he, I think, <laughs> courageously uh, leads the Carmelites during this time uh, through the intercession and intervention of Our Lady. Um, a lot had to change in order for this hermit life to to succeed in Europe. Um, and in his trust of Our Lady as the patroness, that, that she was the lady of the place, she was the one who would take care of all of this, um, Our Lady appears to him and uh, hands on to him the garment that would become the brown scapular. Mm. Um, and she gives the promise as well that as long as you wear this, or- this garment and the children of your order wear this garment, um, you know, you'll succeed. You know, this will this this order will flourish. This order will grow. Um, and essentially, what she's doing is she's she's handing on her consecration mm-hmm. of the order mm-hmm. uh, to the, of the order uh, to the friars. Um, it's it just as a sign of of just uh, consecration and trust in Our Lady uh, that they've already been living for 50, 60 years. Yes, and I think that that key word too of of entrustment that that the scapular was a sign that she would protect them mm-hmm. and we know that they did not have an easy beginning um and nor did it continue to be easy right. even after that but there was this constant sense of mary's protection on this on this order on those on the mm-hmm. friars hermits um and maybe could you just say a little bit about how that protection continued of yeah. our lady well so it's interesting at the time when they went to europe uh, we have to remember that right around the same time that, that the hermits were getting started on Mount Carmel was the, the exact years that St. Dominic, St. Francis uh, were getting started in their own setups. And when we show up, you know, in Europe uh, 50 years later, um, there's a lot of questions about, well, okay, who are these, these, strange, these strange hermits coming from the Holy Land? You know, are they legit? Um, the bishops were very suspicious of them. But the people uh, were very fond of them, and I think a lot of it was because of their devotion to Our Lady. Mm. Um, this is sort of a real pinnacle in the history of the Church of Marian devotion uh, for the Lady. I mean, it was uh, it, devotion to Our Lady was very popular, and we can attribute a lot of that to Saint Dominic as well, who received the Rosary and mm. passed this on as a way, a Marian form of prayer. Mm. Uh, and we have to mention that yesterday was the feast of uh, of the Holy Rosary, Our Lady of the Rosary. Um, so this idea of you know the people becoming very devoted to Our Lady were very much intrigued by this idea that uh, Lady Our Lady had entrusted, um, or that Our Lady had consecrated this order of men, uh, the brothers of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, um, and they liked that and they wanted to be, they were interested in that mm-hmm. right, um, and this garment too they wanted to participate in that and I think here is where you start to see the formation of confraternities, mm-hmm. and these are something that it, they're not unique to the Carmelite order but had existed um, for, for probably two or three centuries in different places, Benedictine monasteries in the form of oblates or confraternities associated with different altars at, in different you know cathedrals and things like that. Uh, so somewhere along the lines, this formation of a confraternity of the brown scapular appears. Um, and it was very simple. I mean, basically the people uh, would, would want to participate in the, in, as children of the order, right? As Our Lady promised, the, the, as long as you wear this garment and the children of your order will be protected, right? So the, the hermits, or at this time they're friars at this point, 
they, they actually just start cutting off little corners of their scapular mm -hmm. um, and, and handing those off. That's how we get that, that, that you know, characteristic little rectangle. Yes, <laughs> everyone knows the, the little yeah. rectangle. Yes. In two pieces of string. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, that's really where it all starts. And um, it's uh, St. Simon Stock writes that, uh, that uh, this vision occurs on July 16th. Um, and so this feast start, uh, starts to occur in, in the places where the Carmelites are, in Sicily, in England. Mm -hmm. um, they become uh, local solemnities, local feast days in those dioceses where the Carmelites are, just because of how devoted the people are to, this, to the devotion of the brown scapular. Yes. Well, and it, it shows that this sense of Mary's protection, I mean, you can see how that would attract people. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to know that you have a mother that is clothing you, you know, is clothing you with her, her own protection like any mother would for her child. Um, and that you, you share in that, in that total protection of Our Lady mm -hmm. over you. Um, and so this devotion, in a sense, is much more than just a devotion. It's a, it's a way of life. It's a way of, of trust. Yeah. And, and that this feast of July 16th celebrates this fact that Mary protects her children and, yeah. and that we can entrust our lives to her. Yeah, I think the perfect example of this idea uh, comes several centuries later uh, during the French Revolution. Um, the Mars of Compiègne, uh, during the Reign of Terror, this is the time of Maxime Robespierre, who is really persecuting the church. Um, these nuns, and I don't have time to get into the, to their whole story, but it's a fascinating story. Um, on the feast, the solemnity for them of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, they're sitting in a jail cell and they're told the next day they're going to be, there's, their trial mm -hmm. is going to happen. Um, and it, they knew that it didn't look good for them um, in terms of, you know, what would happen. Um, and they entrust uh, the whole situation uh, to Our Lady, it being the solemnity of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. I think it would have been extremely obvious to them. Um, and, of course, we can see there's, there's uh, records of, uh, they wrote uh, hymns to Our Lady to the theme of La Marseillaise, which is the, the, <laughs> the anthem of the French Revolution. So they were being a little cheeky, too. So it was... <laughs> It's kind of it's really a fascinating story. I recommend anyone to, to read more about it or watch the opera that's associated with the, the dialogues of the Carmelites. Um, but they entrust their situation to Our Lady, and more than that, they entrust the they entrust their martyrdom that they perceived would happen and did happen the very next day um, would be sort of the you know we talk about the seed of the blood of the martyrs, right? Mm -hmm. That would strengthen the faith in France. This is a time in France when the church was on very rocky ground mm -hmm. and orders were being expelled or murdered. Um, they didn't know what would happen. Uh, but in their courage and their witness as martyrs, they entrusted to Our Lady that she would take care of that and through their offering of their lives um, that everything would work out. And <laughs> lo and behold, 10 days later, uh, on the very same uh, guillotine that the, that the martyrs were, that the, mar the nuns of Compiègne were martyred on, uh, Maxime Robespierre is, 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 is killed uh, and the end of the reign of terror and things significantly settle down uh, in France. And then, of course, we know that uh, a century later, we have the birth of the greatest saint of modern times in France, right? Yes, and, uh, yes. and her sister, uh, St. Elizabeth the Trinity, not too far behind her. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think Our Lady's sort of the way that she appears in history uh, for the Carmelites is absolutely fascinating. There's, there's numerous stories. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, throughout the history of the order in various places that Our Lady has kind of uh, lived up to the promise that she made yeah. to St. Simon Stock. Yeah, it's, it's proved, you know, she's, she stepped in in her own way to make sure that we could keep going mm -hmm. and that the spirituality of Carmel could keep going. Um, and I, as I've read in Mary Alice Coltus, the, the encyclical on, on Marian devotion and, and Marian theology in the church, um, it's talked about there's certain devotions that come from uh, certain orders or, or religious traditions, families like the Rosary mm -hmm. for the Dominicans is one that was named, and also the scapular as, yes, belonging to or coming from a certain order or family in the church, but really being for the whole church yeah, and, and totally. taking on a universal significance. Um, and so with this sense of the scapular and Mary's protection, you know, on all her children that entrust herself themselves to her, um, I guess, how do we see that maybe in a, in a universal scale yeah. or in, in, in terms of the life and theology of the church? Yeah, so it's a really poignant <laughs> question, right? The, how, does, how does something, uh, you know, the brown scapular today, I've got one here, um, 
it's it's so ubiquitous. You know, once once someone hears about it, they want one. They want a priest to enroll them mm -hmm. uh, in the brown scapular. Um, it's it's something that uh, has been recognized as a sacramental in the church. I think that's probably a good way to sort of explain uh, how these things sort of become uh, really a part of the universal church um, as sacramentals. Uh, we know that sacramentals um, are all sort of um, flowing from the sacraments, right? And the the um, the first sacrament that we need to talk about is the sacrament of baptism, right? Mm. So. Um, the, gift, the gift that we receive in our baptism is the gift of sanctifying grace, right? Um, St. Thomas Aquinas in, uh, in question 43, I think, of the Summa uh, talks about how um, through the gift of baptism, the Holy Spirit, uh, it's the Holy Spirit, the mission of the Holy Spirit uh, is to dwell uh, through sanctifying, in sanctifying grace, as sanctifying grace uh, in the souls and indwelling within the, the, the baptized, right? This is the gift that we receive. This is why baptism is, is so important, why we need to be so thankful that we've received this gift, um, because it's through this gift that we participate in the life of the Trinity. Um, and that's something that St. Thomas uh, Aquinas really uh, solidified and, and made very clear and poignant. Um, I recommend anyone to, to read that, that part of the Summa Question 43. Um, it's, it's absolutely, it's a beautiful sort of, a, sort of piece of theology, right? Mm. So from baptism, um, we receive this, this grace, of, uh, this gift of sanctifying grace. Um, and Our Lady, as sort of the spouse of the Holy Spirit, is the first one really to receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Um, and through that, she becomes uh, sort of the, the mother of, of grace, right? She's the one uh, who first received it um, in this way, this way of sanctifying grace. Um, and represents the whole human race at the foot of the cross uh, when uh, when the birth of the church is occurring. Mm. Uh, so she's given this sort of special role um, in the life of grace. Um, and I think this is where sort of her role as the patroness of, of, of contemplative life really um, manifests, right? Um, and in our life uh, as Carmelites, we've already, we're already consecrated to Our Lady, but and we entrust our entire lives to Our Lady, but in a special way, all contemplatives um, should be entrusting their contemplative life uh, through the mediation um, of Our Lady as sort of the, the mediatrix, the mother of divine grace, right? This is her special role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she, she models that for us, even though she was also a very active person, you mm -hmm. know, and, and we know that uh, she had many different ways of following Christ and in her roles, but at the core of it all was prayer, you know, and you see that in her, her praying with the, the 12, with the disciples at Pentecost mm -hmm. and, and invoking the Holy Spirit that the church can be brought forth into the world. So that role of Mary as prayer, as contemplative, mm -hmm. you know, is that so much at the core of, of, of the church. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, and I think, you know, people who, I mean, the, the, this idea of Marian consecration has become um, important in the life, in the sacramental life of the church, in terms of the way people want to participate uh, in the graces that are that are available to people, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, as a sacramental, I think it has that uh, that role in, in people's lives, and that's why you know people want to participate in this. They want to share in the fruits uh, that were given um, by Our Lady to Saint Simon Stock and to the Carmelite Order. Um, and from our uh, standpoint, from our side of uh, of uh, this of Pope John Paul II's sort of uh, claim that this is this is for the whole church, um, is that we're we're willing to share, right? This mm -hmm. is something that that this is what why we exist is to share um, these fruits to the world and to and to help people to teach people how to pray and to uh, entrust themselves to Our Lady and by wearing. Uh, the garment of the brown scapular uh, were visible witnesses of that of Mary's of Mary's life in the church of what she's doing all, you know today yes. here and now yes and that it's it's a it's a silent witness in a sense it's it's wearing something to show in a way it's a it's a constant prayer mm -hmm. you know and and that everyone is called to that silent prayer in some portions of their life some are called to maybe dedicate more time to it than others but everyone is called to have a contemplative life if they really want to be a disciple of Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and Mary is there to, to help us to, to reach that, no matter what our state of life. Right. Um, and maybe just to tie that into with that aspect of, of the silent prayer, this kind of garment, 
where else do we see that? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, so we, we talk about our baptismal garments, right, mm -hmm. and keeping them clean. Uh, there's various passages in Matthew's gospel, particularly um, the, the, the servant who comes into the wedding banquet of the king and he's not wearing his wedding garment, mm -hmm. right? Um, this is sort of a representation of the baptismal garment that will appear um, when the church begins, right, at the, at the crucifixion where blood and water pours from the heart of Jesus, signifying the Eucharist and baptism. Mm -hmm. um, so this, uh, this, this idea of a wedding garment um, or a baptismal garment, I think they're one and the same idea, right? Uh, that this is sort of the, uh, the sign of, uh, of the way in which that we uh, participate in the life of Christ, the life of the Trinity. If, if sanctifying grace that we is the gift we receive at baptism is life with the Trinity, life in the Trinity, uh, then our baptismal garment is the sign of that. So I think through that theology, the, the brown scapular becomes sort of a visible a sign, a sacrament, right, of, of this baptismal garment and uh, Our Lady's role in, in protecting us in that, protecting this gift that we've received, um, keeping our baptismal garment clean uh, so that when uh, we enter into the wedding banquet, we're wearing our wedding garments, right? This is, uh, I think the, the martyrs of Compiègne, to go back, I think they saw this as well. Um, you know, the, the day of their martyrdom as being the day of their wedding, uh, their ultimate uh, sort of... Uh, uh, espousal to our Lord uh, through martyrdom. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that there's there's a huge connection there. Um, and John Paul II, I think, uh, saw it as well. Yes, yes, and it's it's a good reminder. Anytime we put on the scapular, whether it's the the uh, full length scapular as a Carmelite or or the small scapular, you know, it's it's a reminder. I'm I'm putting on Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm putting on Our Lady's intercession that I can be a disciple and give myself to the Lord in in the way that she did. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's I just I hope that people can see this. There's so much beautiful spirituality and theology behind it, right. um, and that wearing this simple sign with faith is such a great way to enter more deeply into that mystery. Yeah, exactly. That mystery of grace. So yeah, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I would encourage anyone who uh, you know maybe heard about the brown scapular before, but was not uh, sure what it meant or what exactly it entailed. Uh, maybe we can talk just a little bit about uh, sort of those requirements of wearing the brown scapular. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, it's it's very simple. It's it's a commitment to daily prayer, um, usually Marian prayer. Uh, throughout the ages, this is kind of it started as the, the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It can be the, the rosary. Um, just a commitment to daily prayer, um, and then a commitment to uh, chastity in one state of life. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of a requirement, and then attendance, uh, uh, regular attendance at mass and reception of the Eucharist. Yes. Um, so those are sort of the the requirements for 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 being a part of the confraternity, of the Brown Scapular, and sort of sharing in uh, those fruits. Mm -hmm. So it's it's rather simple. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have to be this you know, heavy burden or something. It's, 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 it's something that's very life-giving and it's something that is, in a sense, at the very basics of being a disciple. Mm -hmm. You know, those things that you mentioned are requirements for any, anyone who's wanting to live a Christian life, more or right. less. So, so it's just helping to emphasize certain things and focus on certain things. Yeah, and as sort of a sign, um, as John Paul II alluded to, of this being for the whole church, um, any priest uh, can con can can enroll someone in the in the confraternity, um, and once you've been enrolled, you're enrolled. So there's no you don't have to every time if your scapular breaks, yeah. uh, you don't have to be re-enrolled. You don't have to have it uh, re-blessed. It's 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 uh, it's already happened right in that one enrollment. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's very yeah it's a beautiful devotion and uh, a great sign and visible witness of Our Lady's consecration or consecration to Our Lady. Yes, yes, yes. Praise God. All right, so <laughs> I just I brought a quote that I wanted to share as well um, uh, from John Paul II, mm -hmm. uh, kind of on his idea of, of the scapular. So I'll, I'll read that and yeah. we'll, we'll wrap it up there. All right, please do. That'd be great. <laughs> I should tell you that in my youth, when I was about your age, she helped me a great deal. I cannot say to what degree exactly, but I believe it was to a very great extent. She helped me to gain the grace proper to my age in life, the grace to understand my, my vocation. On Mount Carmel in the Holy Land uh, is associated with a piece of clothing. This garment is called the Holy Scapular. I owe a great deal in my early youth to my devotion to the Carmelite Scapular. 
A mother's constant diligence and concern for the clothes of her children is beautiful to see. She always wants them well-dressed. When the children's garments are torn, the mother makes an effort to repair them. The Blessed Mother of Mount Carmel and of the Holy Scapular speaks to us of her maternal care, her concern to clothe us spiritually with the grace of God, and to help us always keep our garments white. Be vigilant to correspond to your good mother who is concerned about how you go about dressed, especially with respect to the garment of grace that her sons and daughters should always wear. This is the wedding garment that we will one day present for our final espousal to enter everlasting life. Hey everyone, Brother Pier Giorgio here. Thanks for checking out this episode of CarmelCast. If you want to hear more of us, don't forget to click subscribe. Also, be sure to click like if you enjoyed this episode, and maybe even leave us a comment. We post discussion questions down below to get the conversation going. Want more information on Carmelite spirituality and the Discalced Carmelite Saints? Then you'll want to check out our website, www.icspublications.org. There's a link in the description of this episode. From here, you can see all our current promotions and access our complete catalog for the writings of St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, and St. Edith Stein. If you want to stay up to date on all our promotions and new titles, then be sure to add your email to our email list. There's no better way to stay up to date on the latest Carmelite publications. Thanks for joining us, and may God bless you.